Welcome back to another volume of Truly Disturbing Tales from Reddit. Today we're going to be narrating three new unsettling stories taken directly from the platform. I encourage you all to sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy these terrifying personal accounts. Now, without any further delay, let's jump right in. This is long, and still ongoing, so I beg you to bear with me. Some context. I, a 24-year-old male, live in a basement suite with my fiancé, 26 years old and female. We live below a man and his young daughter. We're pretty friendly, and look out for one another, but I wouldn't say we're exactly close. It's a normal detached home, just divided. We have no windows facing the backyard, just to the left and the right of the house. Please note that while we live in the same home, we've had no issues other than hearing what is happening upstairs. I personally am also an extremely deep sleeper. Behind the house, beyond our backyard, is a ravine, basically a tiny creek, but it's incredibly steep on either side, covered in bushes and trees, etc. It's not exactly easy to walk around in. We have a short, maybe four feet tall chain link fence dividing our property from the creek itself. One house down from us, there's a little path that leads down the creek and connects to an adjacent field and playground. It's maintained. There are no other paths off of this main one. It's just prickly bushes and steep, tough terrain. Okay, now on to the story. About three months ago, my fiance woke me up terrified because she had heard banging outside, and there were flashlights shining into our ground level windows. I instantly phoned 911, who promptly told me that the cops were already on site, and probably the ones with flashlights. Annoyed, I pulled on some pants and headed outside to see what was going on. I was informed by the police that our upstairs neighbor had called because he stated that people were on his property harassing him. The police ask if we know of any ongoing mental issues on his side, which makes me question if anything actually happened. But my fiance did hear some weird shit before the cops showed up. All the while, I'm watching my neighbor plead with the police to check the creek out back because he swears that whoever it was out there, he saw them go out that way. They briefly shine their flashlights back there, find nothing, and leave determining that nothing is actually going on. I get the lowdown from the neighbor the next day. Apparently, he heard people banging on his back door, throwing gravel at his windows, and he even watched the back door handle turn. The man was freaked out, terrified for his daughter, and he had no clue who it could have been. He spends the next week barely sleeping, sitting by the back door with a baseball bat. Nothing happens so we all relax a bit. But it happens again a week later, just as soon as he chills out. Same deal. Fiance wakes me up. Less scared because we know what's going on, but nevertheless, the cops find nothing, and the upstairs man is freaked once again. This time, he installs cameras. They're on the inside of his house, pointed out the windows. They're rather small and hard to notice. Therefore, there's no way you could see them at night. This seems to do the trick. We no longer are dealing with the cops or the banging from whoever is harassing our neighbor. However, after about a month, I get to chatting in the yard with the neighbor, and he tells me almost every single night, someone has been in the creek shining a light into his windows, his bedroom specifically. Laser pointers, flashlights, you name it. And it's definitely coming from the creek. Now, this part of the story freaked me out a bit, but I tell myself maybe he's overly paranoid. Could be some lights from the other side of the creek. Something with a rational explanation. This keeps going on, though. He consistently is complaining about seeing these lights. Concerned that someone is still f with him and with us being in the same house. Last week, I hauled off and bought the best outdoor camera I could afford with all the fancy night vision features. Doesn't hurt to have security cams anyway, right? They should be arriving soon. In the meantime, I'm thinking of some way to keep someone out of the creek. 
still slightly doubtful anyone could get back there without hopping our fence. I walk down the path that's open to public use, stop where the property fence lines start, push past a prickly bush that tries to take me out, and come across a well-worn path. Equipped with footprints and broken branches, and flattened out bushes that have clearly been walked on repeatedly. Thoroughly creeped out, I push on, just to see where this path goes. And it ends right at our property, exactly where my neighbor says that the lights are coming from. There's nowhere else to go. The path is right next to where it drops off into the creek. I couldn't go further as it's all thick brush and unwelcoming terrain. It just ends at our house. Someone for weeks has been sitting in the woods behind our house, tormenting my upstairs neighbor for no apparent reason. I am unbelievably creeped out by this discovery. How do they know what bedroom he's in? How do they know when the cameras went up? Why do they never bother us? The neighbor swears up and down he doesn't have any enemies. His ex is the mother of his daughter. They share custody and she wouldn't scare her own daughter like that. I'm as baffled as I am horrified. Update. The cameras are now up and have yet to catch anything save for a big fat bear lounging in the yard. Since I put them up, we've had not a singular issue. Absolutely nothing. It's been three days and I don't think we've gone three days without lights or sketchy shit happening in weeks. Upstairs neighbor, also trimmed back a lot of branches and bushes just to make it easier to spot someone if they were lingering beyond our fence. While I don't think we would be able to identify them if they showed up again, as it's dark as hell and pretty far away, I'm confident that no one has been back there since. My cameras are big and look really intense. One of the smaller ones has a little blue light that is on at night, something to do with infrared maybe. So I'm sure that whoever it is They've seen the cameras, know they're there, and know that they're heavy duty enough to catch them. I'm hoping this is enough to deter them. We haven't set anything up to block the path yet. Summer has just started, and I'm exhausted from weeks of spending my nights in an anxiety spiral. And since they've left us alone, I haven't felt that it was imperative. My hope is that I'll find the energy to do it this weekend, though. Things feel calm and good now. And I sincerely hope that it stays that way. I've been a lurker on this sub for several years now, and it's occurred to me to share something that happened when I was 15. To give some background, I was living in a pretty big house in a very safe and popular neighborhood. Let me tell you a little bit about the house, because it has importance. There were five of us living there for starters. My brother, who was then 17. My sister, 16. And usually my parents. This settled, the house was as follows. A ground floor with my sister's bedroom, which was a very large room. It opened up to our garden through a set of beautiful and ornate French doors. It was a nice room with computers, a TV, some of her jewelry, things like that. Then you go up one floor, and you have the living room, the kitchen, the first bathroom, and my parents' bedroom. Again, large TV in the living room, jewelry in my parents' room, even money in the drawers, as my father had to pay for important work on our heating system, and planned to pay in cash. Why he was doing that? That's a good question, and I truly don't have the answer. But given how much time has passed between then and now, he would probably look at me strange for asking him such a question. Third and last floor, my bedroom, my brother's bedroom, the second bathroom, and the sauna. That last admission might seem that we lived in a luxurious house, but several houses in the neighborhood, as well as in our country, all had saunas. And if I'm being honest, we mainly used ours as a wine cave. So now, let me jump into the story. It wasn't a dark and stormy night or anything quintessential to a scary story like that, but it was certainly dark enough in the evening, probably around 5 p.m. 
being that it was winter, the sun had already come and gone. My brother and sisters were not at home. They shared a class and were consequently still at school. My parents, on the other hand, were in France for some administration issue that they needed to sort out, so they had not been home for almost a week. But I was there. I was there, and as any self-respecting teenager, I was in my bedroom, the rest of the house, in complete darkness. I had my headphones on, watching a movie in bed, but I did have the light on in my room. It's important to note that the only thing that I can see from my bedroom window is the front of our house and the street. Half an hour passes, one hour passes, I'm still deeply involved in my movie, and because of my headphones, I don't hear anything outside of what's playing on my screen. But from the corner of my eye, something catches my attention. I lift my eyes from the screen, and I see my doorknob turning. It all happened very quickly. I remove my headphones, thinking that maybe my brother or sister are home. And that's when the door opens. I find myself facing an unknown man in my house. He's young, maybe 20 or so. He looks at me, I look at him. There's about two seconds where our eyes are locked in the most awkward stare down I've ever had in my life. Then he slams the door shut seemingly as hard as he could. I'm on my feet in seconds, and I can admit now, I was a pretty dumb teenager because I immediately flung open the door, only to find three men running down the stairs. I knew that I had never seen these men before in my life. Once I see them, I retreat back into my room, pretty much frozen at this point. I'm not sure if I stood there for a minute, five minutes, or 10 minutes, but eventually I get down the stairs too, head straight to the kitchen, where I can grab the largest knife in our house. Slowly, I begin to explore our entire home, first heading to my parents' room, noticing that it's an absolute mess in there. Drawers open, papers, clothes, everything, tossed all over. But the few things that stand out to me are very clear. There's my father's money, just lying on the floor. There's my mom's jewelry, the TV, computer, nothing has been taken. I proceed to the other parts of the house while simultaneously calling my brother and sister. They don't answer. I'm now calling my best friend who speaks the country's language so she can call the cops for me. Mind you that I don't speak English at this time. That's why I needed to take that in-between step. The more I proceed through the house, the more mess I see. But again, Nothing has been taken. Absolutely nothing. They broke in through my sister's bedroom, using the French doors that lead to our garden. There was broken glass everywhere. But again, while things had been tossed around in her room, nothing had been taken. The police eventually came with dogs, and after the cops came and went, eventually we told my parents what happened. But they never found the guys that broke in. Being an idiot teenager, I used the opportunity to miss school the following day, although I wasn't really traumatized, just more curious than anything. It's wild to me that somebody would take the time to break in, destroy the place, yet choose not to take a single thing from our house. I find it perplexing, even more than a decade later. But still, robbers who didn't rob, I pray that we don't meet again. When I was 10, my family moved into a new neighborhood. It was a quiet cul-de-sac, picket fences, mowed lawns, that type of neighborhood. The first person we met was a neighbor from across the street, Millie, a nice elderly lady who was always out on her porch swing with her cats. She was friendly, welcoming, and overall very sweet to me and my family. She told us that she was a widow and a grandmother who had lived in that same house for 40 years with her husband before he passed. She was excited to have kids, my sister and I, on the block once more. She said as much, but it was also evident with the way her eyes lit up when she'd see us from across the road or coming home from school. 
She just seemed like a kind, lonely old lady. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, one afternoon, no more than a week or two after first moving in, my mom and I were still unpacking some boxes when we heard screaming from across the street. I immediately ran outside. Admittedly, I was a reckless kid. While my mom called the police, I saw a woman who I'd never seen before running out of Millie's house. She was bleeding profusely from her arm and hand, screaming for help. Millie came flying out the door, yelling, get out of my house, over and over again, holding a bloody kitchen knife in her hand. Terrified, I ran back inside our house, crying my eyes out. The police arrived shortly after and took both women away, leaving us to wonder just what was going on. A few days later, my mom met the stabbed woman, Holly, and she explained what had happened that day. Millie had never lived in that house a day in her life, and the cats that she loved so much were really Holly's. Millie had been sitting on Holly's porch during the day while Holly was at work for several months. At some point, Millie found a spare key that Holly kept in a key hider in the garden and had been going into the house during the day, but leaving before Holly would return. Holly had noticed some things were off in her home at night, but didn't think much of it. On the day of the attack, Holly came home early and found Millie sitting in her kitchen. Millie screamed and went after her with a knife, demanding that Holly get out of her house. Millie turned out to be deeply mentally ill, and had a delusion that it was in fact her house, her cats, her neighborhood for most of her life. The police had told Holly that she seemed particularly attached to the cats, that perhaps Millie's connection to them triggered the delusions. When I remember this story, I always get the mixed feelings of sadness while also being horrified. Holly moved away a year or two after this incident it's a mystery to me what happened to Millie. If she got help, was put in an institution, prison, taken in by her family. I've resigned myself to the fact that I'll likely never know.